Okay, so let's consider the following quantity. Just out of the blue, let's calculate delta x squared minus t delta t squared. Let's just grind through. We know how to, uh, uh, let's compute the following co quantity. Uh, and what I mean, what do, what do I mean by calculate? Uh, I mean, um, relate to uh, frame S prime, okay? So when you substitute, you know, sub in the uh, Lorentz transformations in interval form, do it. And you will see that you get gamma, the following thing, gamma squared times delta T delta X prime squared plus I'm cheating, I'm looking at the screen, 2v delta x prime delta t prime plus v squared delta t prime quantity squared minus v squared over c squared delta x prime squared minus 2v delta x prime delta t prime minus c squared delta t prime quantity squared. Oh, this is a mess. But you realize that this term cancels this term. And we have, it's starting to look cleaner. You know, after cleanup, you will see that this equals to delta x prime quantity squared times one minus v squared over c squared divided by one minus v squared over c squared. Let's see. Um, this came from the gamma term and the numerator came from this one and this v squared over c squared. Okay, so, well, evidently, this is just one. Let me keep on writing. Plus something similar that happens with time, plus uh, delta t prime quantity squared. And again, there is v squared minus c squared divided by one minus v squared over c squared, okay? And uh, I can multiply both numerator and denominator by c squared, and what I get is delta x prime quantity squared plus, ooh, not plus, not plus, minus c delta t prime quantity squared, wow! we discovered something really interesting. That while delta X and delta T do change from frame to frame, while all these effects like time dilation and length contraction take place, there is a quantity that remains invariant. Okay? This quantity is called a space-time interval. It's called delta S squared. Well, let me say delta, the quantity delta X squared minus T delta T quantity squared with a minus sign. You see minus sign remains invariant from one reference frame to another. Okay, so this is a big deal. And so if it remains invariant, we just discovered an invariant quantity that was kind of hidden. Okay, and so the square of the interval of space uh, squared minus uh, the interval of C times time squared uh, is called, um, it's called the space time interval. Okay. So perhaps in some books, 
they call delta s the space space time interval. In some books, in some books they call delta s squared the space time interval. It's not that important. The point is that it's invariant. I will call this this whole uh, com combo combination the space time interval, even though it's delta s squared. Don't get hung up on that terminology. So we've discovered an invariant quantity, and this is a big deal. That's what I mean. That a special relativity is not so much about how things change from frame to frame, but it's about the fact that while all these things change, something remains invariant, and it has a very far-reaching consequences. But before we do that, let's uh, just do an example, right? So let's go back to the Alice and Bob example, and we will solve the Alice and Bob problem uh, using the constancy of the space-time interval. Okay, so let's do that. So there are two events. Event one, back windows align, and event two, the front windows align, right? So remember, this is Bob's ship. Or maybe for Bob, it's not the front window, it's his middle window, something like that. And this is Alice's ship. Okay, so it's very important. That's another thing is if you try to use Lorentz transformations, for example, you have to be very clear about what are the events. So again, event one, back windows align. Event two, the other pair well, okay, let me say not the other pair. Let's say the front, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to call it the front windows on, right? The windows align. Okay. So let's uh, figure out what the delta x is, delta x primes are, and so on. So for Bob frame, so for Bob, delta t between the two events, delta t equals zero, and delta x equals 40 meters. Well, we used length contraction to find 40 meters, but let's say we found it. Now I want to know the time. Remember the question was, what's, what's the time here? Okay, so I'm gonna use uh, the space-time interval here, and you can probably already see what I'm doing. Um, analysis frame, Okay, so for Alice, for Alice, delta x prime equals what? 50, the length of her ship, and delta t prime equals unknown. Well, boom, substituted into the uh, invariance, and uh, you can you just find, find out the length, uh, the, you find out the delta t prime. So using invariance, We have delta x prime squared minus c delta t prime squared equals delta x quantity squared because delta t equals zero. And so therefore delta t prime equals plus or minus the square root of delta x prime squared minus delta x squared divided by c. Plus or minus the square root of 50 squared minus 40 squared divided by c equals plus or minus 10 to the minus 7 uh, seconds. Well, we have to choose a sign. And we choose a minus sign uh, from the analysis of series of events in Alice's frame. Or again, uh, from Alice's perspective, Bob is moving backwards. 
So if the window is aligned at heart uh, t prime equals zero, then because this ship is shortened, the other window is aligned from uh, at, at, at negative time. Okay, but at the, you do have to think a little bit, but you can use the invariance of the space-time interval to solve problems. It's a very powerful technique. So it's not just uh, me uh, mumbling something that that excites me. It's 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 a it's a tool that you can use to solve problems. Okay. Uh, incidentally, we can see how a lot of the effects come from. For example, we can see how the relativity of simultaneity comes out of the invariance of space-time intervals. Because while delta t equals zero in, an, in one frame, in, other, in another frame, it's non-zero, right? So uh, relativity simultaneity. Uh, so you can see that delta t equals zero in frame s, then in frame s prime, delta t prime equals plus or minus square root of delta x prime squared minus delta x squared over c, in general non-zero. Time dilation, no problem. Okay, so while, while delta x prime equals zero and delta t prime equals tau, so events take place at the same location, remember time dilation, so events uh, E1 and E2 take place at the same location in frame S prime. That's when that's when the time dilation formula. That's when that's the standard scenario for the time dilation. In another frame, frame. Well, in another, in another frame, delta x equals vt. Because frame s prime is moving with velocity a v relative to frame s. So when Alice starts brushing her teeth, when she ends brushing her teeth, in another frame, she will have moved a distance delta x between the starting event and ending event. The delta x is v times delta t. Okay, so you do have to kind of realize that. Okay, and so therefore, minus c squared tau squared equals minus c squared delta t squared plus v squared delta t squared. And guess what? If you can solve for delta t, you get tau divided by the square root of one minus v over c squared. So you can start seeing why I get excited about the invariance of the space-time interval. Because it basically contains all of relativity. So invariance of delta x squared kind of contains everything. And that's very simple, right? So this is just, look, it looks almost like a Pythagorean theorem, almost. It's like a Pythagorean theorem with a minus sign. And C is just there alone for the ride to make units be the same. It's a unit thing. So if you work in a light years and years, C is one, then it's just delta x squared minus delta t squared. And the invariance of that quantity somehow includes all the relativity effects. You see, so it's only getting simpler and simpler now. But as you can see, it looks almost like the Pythagorean theorem. And Pythagorean theorem is a theorem of geometry. So perhaps this also has a geometric interpretation. Okay, so I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna stop this video and then make the third video in which we examine the geometric consequences of this invariance. So slowly, maybe you're starting to realize that there is some sort of a geometric 
spiel that's waiting to be uncovered, because this looks almost like the Pythagorean theorem. So let's do that in the third video, okay?